Uh, because of Veterans Day, we're going to have a very special performance for you. You're going to meet uh, Colonel Robert G. Shaw, the Massachusetts 54th uh, from the Civil War. And if you saw the movie Glory, this was his story. Uh, Matthew Broderick played him in the movie, and Denzel Washington won an Academy Award for this. So that's the story that we're going to tell uh, about today. The reason that we're telling that particular story is that the Massachusetts 54th would not have happened but for the Unitarians of that time. And among all the Unitarians who made that possible, Shaw, Robert Shaw was probably the least Unitarian among them. Uh, and I say that because I think it's very important when we're historical that we give a more accurate picture. Uh, his, uh, he was more of a generalized Protestant and he said he would enjoy any worship uh, on, uh, from a variety of pulpits. His parents, though, were big time Unitarians. Uh, they founded a couple of different congregations. They were major financial supporters of the Massachusetts 54. Uh, and you will hear about other Unitarians who were essential to making the 54th come about uh, in our little production. The source of this material is largely this book, which is a collection of letters he wrote, uh, and uh, Civil War letters. Uh, which was my summer reading material, uh, and from which uh, I have adapted this little short play. So the, the inter, uh, in between letters is stuff that I wrote, but when you hear our actor uh, quoting a letter, these are direct quotes from Shaw's letters in his own words. Now, something about the setting. This is going to be set in Camp Reedville, which was the recruiting and training grounds for the Massachusetts 54th. It's right outside Boston. Uh, what you're going to see, I'll tell you what's, what's historical and then where I took a little dramatic license. Uh, as part of our set for today, we have our choir that is going to uh, play the roles of visiting Unitarians, and that would actually have been historical. Uh, many Unitarians and other delegations would come out to the camp to visit uh, with Shaw and others and to see the progress of the Massachusetts 54th and to see how this, uh, this endeavor was going. So the idea that there would be a delegation from Unitarian congregations coming to visit Shaw and that he would address them and give them kind of an update on how things were going, that part is fairly uh, accurate. That would have happened. He's going to be reading from his letters, which is partly uh, historical and partly not. Obviously, the letters themselves are historical. It's not likely he would have read letters to visiting uh, uh, Unitarians. However, his mother had the habit of publishing his letters in the paper uh, as a way of showing the rest of the community how proud she was of her son and uh, how the endeavors was going. So it's quite possible that these, these delegates would have read some of the very materials that you're going to have quoted to you. So the source material is, is historically very accurate. The setting's pretty close to being accurate. Uh, and uh, the rest is a little bit of dramatic license. So just to set the stage, uh, one other historical point. And again, we need to be honest about our history on this. Uh, we've got people that were on both sides of the slavery question. I shouldn't say both sides. We didn't have any folks that were generally pro-slavery, but in our history, we had abolitionists and we had a fairly large number that were more moderate, who felt like slavery ought to be ended over time, only after slave owners were compensated. They were very hesitant to go to war over slavery until Fort Sumter, and then that changed a lot of minds. Not everybody who opposed the Massachusetts 54th uh, should be seen in a negative light, and not everybody who was for it should necessarily be seen in a positive light. There was a great fear, even among abolitionists, that if you armed all the blacks, they would seek retribution, and they wouldn't be asking people which side they were on before they started shooting. And so there was a great uh, unease among people about starting this uh, endeavor because of that. There were also a lot of people who were for this regiment for less than noble reasons. That's because every state had a quota to provide in the military, and they didn't want to lose all the workers to their factories. And so they thought that uh, enlisting the black, uh, blacks from the Massachusetts area would help protect their industry and their commerce and keep their jobs going. So some of the people who opposed that were the Irish, who would have taken those jobs had uh, they become available. And when we say Irish, we say that means Catholic. And I point that out because we have to be honest about our history too. We've got some anti-Catholicism that's a strain in our Unitarian history. We need to acknowledge it. Robert Shaw certainly was one of those folks as well. 
So with that background, our play begins. reformer 
of the family. She and my father both were very active. In fact, my father, because of my paternal grandfather's success in business, my father was able to retire at the age of 32 to dedicate himself to social reform. Mother and father both were members of the anti-American uh, slave society. And then later, they helped to form the Boston Vigilance Committee, which was an organization that helped runaway slaves. Uh, during my early years, I am privileged to, or was privileged to have sat at the feet and indeed at the table of many notable abolitionists of the day, including Ralph Waldo Emerson and Nathaniel Hawthorne came to our home many times, as did uh, essayist Margaret Fuller. And Mother was very good friends with Harriet Beecher Stowe. And some of you are aware that her brother is a noted Unitarian minister, but of course she's more well known as the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, a book which I have read numerous times and which has had a profound influence on me and probably many of you have as well. But I digress a little bit. I said that I was raised in the Unitarian faith. Mother and father were members of the uh, Unitarian Church um, led by Reverend Theodore Parker. I've attended his services many times, especially during the two years that I attended Harvard. And uh, I, I have to say now, with a little bit of hindsight, that this is my opinion. I don't think there's another minister in the entirety of the United States who can match Reverend Parker's passion for abolition and at the same time his rhetorical skill that allowed him to uh, advocate for that cause. Uh, we now know that he is one of the secret financiers of John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. Early in my military career, I was stationed at Harper's Ferry, and I had the opportunity to not only visit the site of John Ferry's, uh, John Brown's raid, but also the site of his execution. And uh, one is left to wonder how our country might have turned out had he been uh, successful in his efforts. Um, it was my father, getting back to him for a second, who delivered to me the letter from Governor Andrews asking me to take command of this very unit. I have to say to you that at first I was, I was hesitant. I, in fact, I, I declined his offer at the beginning. And the reason is I felt a loyalty to my comrades in the second mass, of which I was a member at the time. So I declined his opportunity to, to lead this regiment, much to the disappointment of my mother. I am happy to say that I reconsidered that, and I am now uh, proud to be a member of this organization, and I'm proud to lead these men. I've always been of the opinion that the black soldiers could fight just as well as white, white soldiers, and certainly they have the right and the ability to fight for their freedoms. If you'll allow me to, I'll tell you a little bit more about my, my parents, and then I want to share some letters with you, if, if that's okay with you. Uh, I'll tell you about the letters in a moment. Mom and Dad, mother and father grew up in uh, Boston, and I was raised in Boston. We lived there many years until we finally moved to Long Island, where they started a Unitarian church there. And uh, that's where they met Governor Andrews. And as I said, I have some letters that I would like to refer to Mother used to print my letters in the newspaper. I asked her to stop, but I am now glad that she did. One of these days when all of this is over, I look forward to spending some time with my letters reminiscing about days gone by. Let me see here. Of course, this is not a new military, this is not an old military unit. This is a new regiment. I was with the 7th. New York Militia at the beginning of my military career. The 7th was one of the first units to go into Washington City to defend the Capitol, and I was among them. We slept in the House and the uh, chambers of the U.S. representatives. We also had an audience with President Lincoln at one point. Some months later, I was with a friend of mine named King, and he uh, was going to visit William Seward, the Secretary of State. On our way, we asked if we could once again have an audience with President Lincoln, and we were able to arrange that. And here's something that I wrote about that visit. After waiting a few moments in the antechamber, we were shown into a room where Mr. Lincoln was sitting at a desk, perfectly covered with letters and papers, somewhat like my desk here. He got up and shook hands with us in the most cordial way, 
asked us to be seated and seemed quite glad to have us come. Though you judge a man in a five-minute conversation, we were very pleased with what we did see of him. Early camp life was somewhat different from what it is now, and I, and I have to say in all honesty that life was not so hard on the officers as it was for the enlisted men. We were able to stay at local boarding houses and have more comfortable uh, sleeping arrangements at times. Also, those of us who were from families of means would sometimes ask our families to send to us some of the comforts of home. And I have a letter here in which I, yes, in which I asked my father to send me a few things. Dear Father, I wrote this in May 1861. Please send two pounds of green seal smoking tobacco to be got from H.G. Beach and Company, 71 Pine Street, and some cakes of Orinoco tobacco, which is milder than the others and which is for myself. Also, a box of mild Havanas. We are six men in a tent, so that everything that comes in is common property. You might put some oranges, nuts, etc., in the box. It's not the only difference. We officers simply live a more, uh, more comfortable life. We had better cots to sleep on, better food, and servants in abundance from among our men. Excuse me. Yes, Captain. I'm sorry, folks. My aide needs to see me for a minute. I'm going to step away, but I believe that some of our guests have prepared a song. This is a song that is one of the songs that our men sometimes sing around the campfire. So I hope that you folks will enjoy the musical interlude as I check with my aide. Thank you very much.
can say that from the earliest days of my life, I had believed in the ability and the right of black soldiers, colored soldiers, to fight for their freedoms. But not everybody agreed with me, even among sympathetic Northerners. There were some people who were afraid to arm the blacks for fear that they would exact retribution without regard to North or South. And I wrote about this to a friend in 1861. I said, isn't it extraordinary that the government won't make use of the instrument that would finish the war sooner than anything else, the slaves? What a lick it would be at them to call on all the blacks in the country to come and enlist in our army. They would probably make a fine army after a little drill and could certainly be kept under better discipline than our independent Yankees. Uh, a little known historical fact among some is that one of our generals actually issued an Emancipation Proclamation before President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. That was General John Freeman, who at the time was commander of the Western Armies. And he issued an, an Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves in Missouri. But Governor, but excuse me, President Lincoln rescinded that order. He was afraid that it would cause uh, unrest among some of the border states, and he uh, turned that order over, much to the disappointment, I must say, of my mother and my father. And I have often thought of the, read the poet James Russell Lowell, who said, how many times are we to save Kentucky and lose our self-respect. Well, we finally did get the real Emancipation Proclamation, and I must say, I was, I was not impressed. This came after Antietam, and it was, I thought, a very limited document. I wrote this letter to Mother sometime after the Emancipation Proclamation was released. For my part, I can't see what practical good it could do now. Wherever our army has been, there remain no slaves, and the proclamation will not free them where we don't go. Jeff Davis will soon issue a proclamation threatening to hang every prisoner they take and will make this a war of extermination. The condition of the slaves will not be ameliorated, certainly if they are suspected of plotting insurrection or trying to run away. I do not mean to say it is not the right thing to do, but that as a war measure, the evil will overbalance the good for the present. Of course, after we have subdued them, it'll be a great thing. That's easy to say, but on the battlefield, we don't often think of politics in that way. None of that matters. My unit first saw action in October 1861. We were stationed in Frederick, Maryland. Most of our action was in western Maryland and northern Virginia. One of my very best friends, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., was wounded in his first battle. Thankfully, he survived. He was shot in the lungs and in the legs. But many people, as you know, did not survive. Not all of my friends are, are able to talk about their experiences as Oliver is. Mother and father came down for a visit at one of our camps. And I wrote this as part of that visit. We shall have much more soldiering to do than we expected than we started. Our units were first engaged in battle at Cedar Ridge, which at the time I thought was a significant battle, until I faced Antietam. 6,000 men died in two days at Antietam. I've, uh, I've never seen anything like that before or since. And I wrote this letter to my mother just a couple of days after the battle, and this helps to put, put things into context. I wish we could both feel whenever we are thinking of each other. You don't know how often I have thought of you during those terrible days, almost as much as you have me, I believe. The night of the battle, Charlie Morris and I laid together and talked about our homes and those of thousands of dead about us. And it seems to me as if I could see the house and all of you there. If this had been the last battle, what a blessing it would be. But of course, it was not the last battle. So here we are at Camp Reedville preparing for a much longer war than we expected from the beginning. More than likely we'll be here for at least a couple more months getting the 54th ready for battle. And if I may again, I've got some letters. I've actually been writing to my sisters. I have uh, my sister Annie and my sister Effie that I've written some letters to. 
And this gives you an uh, indication about how camp life has been going. Here we go. Let's see. This was a letter that I wrote to my sister Annie just back in February. We have opened the camp at Reveal. Got the barracks in good order, and we sent 27 men out there. I have a good quartermaster who has got all the necessary stores out there and seems to be attending to his business in the most satisfactory manner. You see, every day we had more and more men who wanted to join us, and I'll get Mr. Stearns part of the credit for that. I've already said that he is in charge of our recruiting effort. News of this regiment began to spread, and the best and the brightest of not only colored blacks, a colored free men, but also former slaves began to arrive. Uh, a couple of days after I wrote that letter to my sister Annie, I wrote this to Effie. We have 40 darks out here now and expect some more from New York and New Bedford in a day or two. When I hear from Providence, Fortress Monroe, and Canada, I shall be able to tell how rapidly the regiment will be likely to fill up. And I was especially pleased with the men from New Bedford. I wrote again to my sister Annie that the men from New Bedford are a fine body of men and out of 40, only two cannot read and write. And on that same subject, I wrote a letter to my mother about the intelligence of the men. Uh, the intelligence of the men is a great surprise to me. They learn all the details of guard duty and camp service infinitely more readily than the Irish I had had under my command. Of course, we are not immune to the life and the effects of being in a military camp. I do set high standards for my men, but I don't set them on a pedestal. I have a letter somewhere here in this, this locker, which is in need of a good cleaning, I see. I have a letter, here they are, a letter that I wrote to my father about this subject. Here we go. I wrote this to father. Everything continues to progress favorably with the 54th. We now have 730 men. They are beginning to desert. There are 17 to 20 absent without leave, none caught yet. I shall set a detective at work tomorrow. And we are set ourselves. As I said, we're going to stay here for at least a couple more months. In May, on May 28th to be precise, we are sent to sail down to South Carolina to join forces that are already fighting there. My men are eager to prove themselves in battle, and I, as a man who has believed in their ability to fight for themselves, am eager for them to do so. I have had and will continue to thank God a thousand times that I have been led to take part in this effort. I wish you well. Thank you for your visit today.